Good morning and welcome to our uh, final grand rounds for this academic uh, season. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. We have two of them. It's Daniel Brown and Rangel, uh, assistant at Esmeralda University. She has nine years of experience uh, in neurosurgery and is currently the senior director of physician assistant and inpatient services for Global Neurosciences Institute. Daniel also serves as an advanced uh, practitioner education sub, uh, subcommittee co-chair for the uh, American Academy of Neurological Surgery. Um, areas of interest include endovascular neurosurgery and neurocritical care. Um, Randall Faber is a neurosurgical physician assistant and is the director of clinical informatics and physician assistant services at GNI. He has been a physician assistant since 2012, completing his training at Drexel Hahnemann Physician Assistant Program and his experience in neurosurgery and neurocritical care. He's adjunct clinical faculty at regional physician assistant programs, including Salas and Drexel, with special interest in clinical precepting and education. And Randall and Danielle will be speaking today about how to hydrocephalus and when to sound the alarm. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so our topic uh, today is um, hydrocephalus and when to sound the alarm. Um, we have no disclosures, nothing to disclose. Um, obviously, we get brief introductions, so you recognize who we are. Um, and objectives of our presentation today. We'd like you to be able to define the anatomy of CSF production, drainage, and clinical considerations. Evaluate uh, the type of adult onset hydrocephalus, obstructive versus communicating, the implications, um, and paying special attention to the urgency of these findings. We'll have you describe the clinical pathway for workup and treatment in both outpatient and inpatient settings. <clears throat> so some key terminology we think is going to be important uh, for you to recognize are uh, some things that we talk about in neurosurgery that often people uh, not in neurosurgery don't uh, immediately uh, see as ter uh, some terms. So posterior fossa refers to the part of the skull and brainstem that's just in the back. Um, that includes uh, the cerebellum brainstem. Dural sinuses, uh, we refer to, uh, or sometimes it's just called sinuses. Uh, they're the venous channels that lie between the meninges and um, drain blood from big veins uh, in, in your brain. They're gonna be important when we talk more about um, draining CSF into the subarachnoid space and ultimately back into circulation. Um, NPH, uh, colloquially referred to as NPH is normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, and linking to that is something called a high volume LP. And what that really is, is just 35 to 40 cc's of fluid that's taken off during a lumbar puncture. Um, EVD, uh, referred to as an extraventricular drain or ventriculostomy. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, that's a catheter that's placed um, in, the, in the brain uh, to divert CSF and hydrocephalus. And then lastly, uh, ETV or endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which we'll talk about further. So the basics of hydrocephalus, uh, a Greek origin, hydro water, cephalus head, um, it's an abnormal accumulation of CSF within the brain. Uh, it can be for various reasons, whether it be decreased absorption or some sort of obstruction um, that is causing this increase. We do see this very commonly in infants and children, um, but can also have significant uh, repercussions in the adults, and we'll focus mostly on the adult today. Um, here you have an infant with hydrocephalus, and obviously, you know, adults with hydrocephalus don't always have these large, enlarged skull, but um, a lot of times in, in babies and infants, it's much more pronounced um, and, and uh, more visually uh, recognizable. So this is uh, some of the many uh, views of hydrocephalus. So in the black, you see the lateral ventricles in the top left here. Um, you can see they're markedly dilated. You can have any shade of gray in between this and normal. Um, and that's what makes this kind of a challenging topic is um, not everyone's brain looks the same. So um, how are we to tell when something's significant or not significant? Yeah, hopefully, you know, after this talk, you guys will have uh, some better insight into that um, because we're seeing this every day. But certainly, you know, if you're an ER provider, maybe somebody in the ICU, you may not see this all the time. <clears throat> so some basics, right? It's always important to go back to the basics is really understand how CSF moves uh, throughout the ventricular system, right? 
Um, so anatomically, you know, your ventricles, when we look on CAT scans, they just look like we're just looking at a slice, but really they're, you know, a three-dimensional shape and they look like giant C's. You know, if you're looking straight down, it's a big C and that's what's sort of depicted here. You have this very large anterior horn of the ventricle. And then there's also a sort of a temporal horn. And then CSF will move in this direction uh, through uh, the ventricular system and then down into be reabsorbed. So what does that actually look like? So, you know, your CSF is produced by your choroid plexus um, lining the lateral ventricles and they move through um, these foramen. So second, it moves to the intraventricular foramina and that's here um, out, out of that goes into the third ventricle and they're sort of named sequentially. It's also helpful to, under, you know, to remember that sort of first order, second order type of thing, but um, in your third ventricle and then through there, another aqueduct or a passageway, um, the aqueduct of Silvius or the cerebral aqueduct, um, and then down into the fourth ventricle, which is um, sort of in the back of the brain and, and very uh, much lower than the rest and out, out through there goes different foramina such as Lushka and Magendi into the subarachnoid space and then uh, back into uh, circulation, or it may go down into the central canal of the spinal cord um, because your spinal cord is also bathed in CSF. Yeah, I think it's important to keep that three-dimensional model uh, in mind. I think a lot of people see the lateral ventricles and think of those as the ventricles, but it's really a full system and obstructions exactly. anywhere along the way uh, can cause you to have problems, uh, not just in the lateral ventricles. That's a good point. <clears throat> so the dynamics and relevant anatomy for CSF here, just some basic terms for you so you can understand what's happening, how much is being produced. Roughly 500 cc's of CSF is produced per day, approximately 25 uh, milliliters per hour. Uh, the ventricular system contains between 125 and 150 mLs at any given time. I think it's important to also recognize that, um, you know, when, when you have an obstruction somewhere, your body doesn't just all of a sudden shut off CSF production, right? This is a continuous process that's moving all the time. And so if you think about it, despite having an obstruction, there's still the same amount of CSF that's going to be produced. And so we have to think about that is why we sort of move quickly on patients that have acute hydrocephalus is because of this problem. Yeah, absolutely. There's no negative feedback system. And so your brain doesn't know that it should stop producing CSF when there's an obstruction. And so, you know, at 25 cc's an hour, it's, pressure is going to build pretty quickly if you have an acute problem. Uh, the CSF is 99% water. There's uh, some other substances um, that go along with that protein, glucose, electrolytes. Uh, the CSF is produced in the choroid plexus, uh, about 80%, and the network of blood vessels that line the inner uh, ventricles uh, with ependymal cells. And so on the right here, you can see the pie graph, uh, just explaining where, where the CSF is living. Um, 100 cc's in the cranial subarachnoid space, uh, spinal subarachnoid space, significantly less, 25 cc's. <laughs> Lateral uh, ventricular horns between 25 and 30, third ventricle, fourth ventricle, much, much smaller, uh, two to three mLs each. So, you know, recognizing that when you have very enlarged third ventricle, fourth ventricle, these are not systems that can accommodate this type of uh, volume. And um, that's sort of when we get called and uh, when we need to intervene. <clears throat> So some interesting, you know, points about dynamics and venous drainage, because what happens when, you know, CSF is going to be reabsorbed. And so a lot of people don't recognize that the veins of your brain or the venous system has a really important role in um, reabsorption for CSF, right? So as soon as it enters the subarachnoid space, but what happens then? So, you know, a lot of the um, circulating uh, CSF goes into arachnoid granulations and these granulations, which are sort of intimately uh, associated with uh, the big draining veins of your brain will then circulate CSF down and around and back uh, down into your internal jugular veins. So again, these are uh, the predominant ways that um, the CSF is drained, but it's important clinically because if there's an obstruction, a clot somewhere in these veins, you're not only going to back up blood, but you're really going to, you could develop hydrocephalus because it's a, the only sort of out flow tract for us to uh, circulate CSF. And so why we get very excited and, and excitement is really just because we want to make sure we're catching these things early is that cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, right? Like I think clinically, there's a lot of clinical people that are interested about, you know, why we do things the way we do. And um, 
sinus thrombosis is really important because lack of venous drainage, because you can develop hydrocephalus, because you can have ICP problems. And then those veins are, are very uh, thin and they rupture, it can cause a hemorrhage. Yeah, I think very important to keep in mind, uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is not all that common. Um, but in a circumstance where you see a patient with this, you should be thinking about, uh, you know, their ICP uh, and, and what might happen uh, if this propagates and gets worse. Exactly. So the classification of hydrocephalus um, is either primary or acquired, um, and we can break that down into uh, communicating and non-communicating, uh, non uh, also obstructive hydrocephalus. And so primary hydrocephalus, uh, usually found in infancy, is either congenital, developmental, or genetic. Mm -hmm. um, we deal a little bit less with that just because we're dealing mostly with adults. We are more focused on acquired adult onset issues hemorrhages, infections, tumors, things that are causing obstructions um, and therefore leading uh, to acquired hydrocephalus. <clears throat> so, you know, primary hydrocephalus we'll touch upon, but we're not going to go too deep into it. Obviously, a lot of different reasons why patients may have hydrocephalus from a primary standpoint. Um, genetic abnormalities, L1 cam mutation, aqueductal stenosis, again, can cause hydrocephalus. Something called bickers adams syndrome is an X-linked, uh, it's pretty rare disorder um, that can cause aqueductal stenosis, but also a myriad of other different uh, developmental anomaly, anomalies, intellectual disabilities, things like that. Um, arachnoid cysts are large collections of CSF in the brain. Um, again, uh, those can, if they're large enough, uh, can cause hydrocephalus. Neural tube defects, so defects in sort of your makeup, you know, just manufacturing um, defect. And we <clears throat> commonly see uh, Dandy Walker malformations, um, which affects sort of the posterior fossa, your cerebellum, um, and large uh, CSF spaces um, that may be present at birth. Excellent hydrocephalus again, and then uh, Arnold Chiari malformations, uh, type two and type three. Um, those children are prematurity, um, so they can have something called germinal matrix hemorrhage, just a sort of an abnormal formation of the germinal matrix within the ventricles, and then they get intraventricular hemorrhage. Um, that hemorrhage can cause hydrocephalus. Um, we mentioned aqueductal stenosis, if you recall. <clears throat> Anatomically, the aqueduct, uh, if that's narrowed, can, can then create this type of obstructive um, hydrocephalus. And then um, rarely, but congenital rubella an infection in the yeah. in maternal um, stage can uh, pass it on to baby. And then um, that fetus uh, can develop abnormal hydrocephalus. Yeah. With rubella, um, infection prior to pregnancy within a month prior to, or during the first trimester is, uh, is pretty devastating. Um, 50 to 60, 70% of these uh, mothers will go on to have children who have um, you know, congenital uh, issues from rubella. So, so maybe, something to recognize. Definitely. Yeah, maybe not seen a lot here in the United States, but in other populations who aren't as vaccinated. Um, so acquired adult onset hydrocephalus. Um, here on the left, uh, you'll see a picture of an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, also uh, in our pictures here, you can see um, infection or anything that can obstruct um, the CSF. So is it meningitis or ventriculitis? Is there uh, a colloid cyst, uh, pineal tumor? Uh, are you not reabsorbing? Uh, has the blood from an injury um, or an aneurysm caused you to have a failed reabsorption of CSF? Uh, traumatic injuries, it can be uh, less commonly idiopathic. Mm -hmm. So anytime you see someone with a uh, new adult onset uh, hydrocephalus, a further workup um, is warranted for sure. Sometimes immediately you'll see the cause uh, on advanced imaging and sometimes it requires uh, you know, a more invasive workup. Definitely. So, um, so what are, what are these terms used? So communicating hydrocephalus, um, it's just when CSF is blocked after it and exits the ventricles, right? So CSF is flowing between the ventricles. If you think about the exit and entry points are where our pathology lies, you get this very sort of symmetrically enlarged ventricular system throughout. Um, that may be again, reabsorption that's uh, decrease through the arachnoid villi, those small projections that uh, drain into your venous system. But you can see on this MRI, <clears throat> the, the, the ventricles are, are in white, um, and that's sort of on a T2 image, CSF is white. And so that intensity, you can see how, how much larger they are than <clears throat> what we've seen on normal CAT scans. Um, this is contrasted to non-communicating hydrocephalus, which is a, just an obstruction to normal CSF circulation, right? So it's some area of the plumbing is blocked, 
and that movement of CSF um, is impaired. It's at some level. What you're seeing on the left is a CAT scan of uh, somebody with a cerebellar hemorrhage and <clears throat> the blood in the posterior fossa um, is causing obstruction, likely the fourth ventricle, which is causing a dilatation of the third ventricle and then the subsequent lateral ventricles. You can also see blood that's layered uh, within um, the ventricles. And a lot of times we get uh, called and um, these patients can be very sick or look okay, um, but oftentimes they do require um, some sort of intervention. Yeah, absolutely. And these are patients who may decline progressively over hours, you know, yeah. as you have this acute cerebellar hemorrhage, your body keeps producing CSF. And so um, these are patients who need to be either admitted uh, or transferred quickly. Um, in a matter of hours, they can decompensate and need a, an, an intervention. So mm -hmm. something to keep in mind, if you're seeing something like this, um, or, or you're getting a report back from a CAT scan with intraventricular hemorrhage, or uh, that the fourth ventricle is compressed, those are all warning signs that, that uh, hydrocephalus may develop. Definitely. Early communication with your neurosurgical providers, um, you know, is, is key so we can sort of collaborate on what sort of next steps will be. Um. <clears throat> so signs and symptoms of hydrocephalus, we're going to go through a myriad of signs and symptoms. Unfortunately, a lot of these symptoms overlap with other conditions, and so it makes it sometimes more difficult um, to tease out what is from hydrocephalus, uh, you know, does the patient just have a headache and doesn't have hydrocephalus? And so I think it's a difficult uh, diagnosis sometimes to get to. Um, and so we just want to go through the specifics. Some very general symptoms, double vision, headaches, gait instability, um, slow mentation, uh, late signs are lethargy. So hydrocephalus, um, one of the kind of classic but late findings is the sunset sign. Mm. It's the inability to deviate your eyes vertically. Uh, it's usually associated with severe and chronic hydrocephalus. You have pressure on your cranial nerves um, and this causes the de deviation. Again, it's usually a uh, late chronic <laughs> finding, but if you see this, sometimes we see it in a, a patients with you know, very acute hydrocephalus and you see that limited upward gaze, mm -hmm. um, that is another clinical indicator that the pressure inside their head is too high. You know, and these are very pronounced, like these are significant, uh, you know, examples of sunsetting sign because their hydrocephalus is so severe. Um, this is sort of contrasted with, and sort of flows along with Paranod syndrome. I don't know if you've heard about it. Um, we we uh, sort of see it rarely, but um, we recognize um, what it reflects. And um, it's named after the French ophthalmologist Henri Pernard, Paranod, and it's sort of a triad of symptoms, but the most common one we see is that impaired upward gaze conversions. <clears throat> um, there's also retraction nystagmus um, and pupillary hyporeflexia. So some, those are some of the symptoms and signs that you may see uh, when you're evaluating these patients. Um, it's secondary to the compression of the rostral midbrain and the pretectum at the colliculus. So basically in the midbrain, there's something that's compressing it. Um, a lot of times that can be a pineal gland tumor, patients with MS, um, again, hydrocephalus is one, or maybe they had a small midbrain stroke. And now, um, those, those areas, uh, your visual pathways are impaired, but we have to make sure the patient doesn't have hydrocephalus. So oftentimes further neuroimaging is warranted. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So signs of hydrocephalus may be a little bit different. Uh, obviously, children, young adults uh, are may, may be less able to convey to you problems that they're having. You might see, um, you know, changes a little bit later than you would in an in adult. Uh, but in general, you can review the list here. Um, I think something that's often overlooked in both children and adults is uh, irritability and agitation. That's one <clears throat> of the first signs of hydrocephalus. And um, sometimes, I think people mistake that uh, for something else. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, then they progress to things like lethargy and, you know, intractable nausea, vomiting, uh, which are really late signs of uh, hydrocephalus. Uh, for adults, they might be even more vague symptoms, uh, difficulty walking, kind of people describe feeling stuck, uh, mental impairment, it may be progressive, it may be acute, um, it may be confused or, um, you know, uh, overshadowed by some dementia, mm -hmm. slowing of uh, movements or loss of uh, bl bladder control. So a lot of these, again, kind of gray symptoms, like yeah. could be from many different causes, 
Um, but when you're seeing uh, patients, whether it be in the office or in the emergency room, it's important to, to ask some of these questions. Uh, maybe one of them wouldn't point you in the direction of hydrocephalus, but uh, many of them might. Yeah, so, so you know, if you suspect and you see some of these symptoms, like what is our next step, right? Well, neuroimaging is going to be key and central to their dog diagnosis, right? If we don't, if we don't know hydrocephalus is there, we don't haven't gotten a scan. And that's, you know, what we um, sort of rely on very heavily is our first line imaging. Everybody's getting CAT scans of every, you know, um, everyone if they have a suspicion. So we often already have a CT, but sometimes advanced imaging, you know, uh, providers, physicians may not necessarily already have. Some of the things you recognize on a CT scan, we'll talk about some of the features, but in large ventricles with ballooning of the ventricles, sometimes they refer to as the Mickey Mouth sign, um, just his big ears referring to the, the big lateral ventricles. Transependable edema, which we'll talk about, um, <clears throat> and periventricular hypoattenuation, sulsal effacement, right? If there's so much fluid, you're, you're eliminating some of the normal an anatomy that we can see. And then um, one of the findings we may see are thinned and elevated corpus callosum. <clears throat> on an MRI. Um, again, we're going to see in large ventricles, we may again see transependymal edema, um, but really we're trying to find a lesion, right? MRI is really sensitive for picking up um, lesions. And when we use contrast, those lesions may um, sort of reveal themselves um, as a de you know, degree of obstruction, whether they're in the, in the front of the brain, posterior fossa, it all just depends. Yeah. I think it's important um, for all providers to know <laughs> if you have a patient who you suspect is hydrocephalus, maybe they're coming into the emergency department where they had an intraventricular hemorrhage two days ago, and now they have an exam change. CAT scan is your first line. Um, Definitely. We do utilize MRI for many instances, but you don't want to put someone with a cu acute hydrocephalus <laughs> lying flat in an MRI for 45 minutes to, uh, to get a picture. So um, a if there's an acute exam change, go <clears throat> straight to CAT scan um, and, and we can get the information that we need. If they need an intervention or a drain or something to help relieve the pressure, we can do that and maybe <laughs> move on to MRI, um, but placing them in the MRI first uh, would, would not be preferred. Definitely, all bad things can happen in MRI, so. <clears throat> uh, Transependable flow is an important uh, radiographic finding that helps us determine um, the acuity of hydrocephalus. So um, where the arrows are pointing here um, around the ventricles is transependymal flow. And uh, this is fluid that's moving through the ependymal layers uh, of the cells lining the ventricles. The pressure is so high, it's starting to push this fluid out. Mm -hmm. um, and this is uh, <clears throat> usually seen in an acute hydrocephalus picture. And this helps us determine um, the acuity and, and the need for intervention. But this finding, or uh, if you see this on a CAT scan report, um, is something that should be uh, immediately discussed with neurosurgery. Definitely. <clears throat> and our neuroradiology colleagues are sort of astute to a lot of these findings, especially with a good clinical history. So providing, you know, um, <clears throat> your radiologist with all the history that they can, you can to help really make a determination on, um, you know, what is the acuity, the patient just all of a sudden developed lethargy, include this um, to give our, you know, best uh, look and interpretation of what we're looking at. So some, uh, again, does some diagno additional diagnostics, um, MRI CNA flow, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then lumbar puncture, um, sort of common, uh, commonly done procedure, but it's something that um, <clears throat> can be used for hydrocephalus and opening pressure. When you put that needle in and you put a manometer up to it, you know, if it's greater than 20, we should have suspicion uh, that they're under pressure and um, there may be hydrocephalus. Um, again, I mean, this is sort of common sense, but sometimes we don't, we don't actually realize in the moment. We need to make sure there isn't any obstructive lesion or any mass lesion in the brain with a CT um, because um, you can definitely cause um, sort of a sump effect by pulling a lot of CSF from below and that obstructive lesion can then get, you know, get worse. So always want to make sure there isn't any CAT scan evidence of any mass lesion, but you may just see hydrocephalus. Yeah. And a lot of time they may just be communicating. Absolutely. Uh, it'll depend on what type of lesion it is, where it is, but it's something you should uh, think about or maybe have a conversation with someone else about if you see a mass lesion. Now, the last thing that you want to do is a lumbar puncture uh, where you cause a downward herniation yeah. um, because there's mass effect. So um, just an important thing to keep in mind when you're ordering lumbar punctures. Um, so Definitely. Yeah. Um, some, some less common studies, but we, we use them are CSF flow studies. It's a flowmetry um, CSF flow study. They use a, something called phase contrast MRI. And 
what that does is to sort of identify the to and fro of pulsatile CSF, right? If your CSF is moving continuously throughout um, the ventricular system, we can actually look via MRI and, and see that um, flow really well and can help us diagnose um, certain um, pathology. So what is it helpful in using? Well, we talk about um, patients with large arachnoid cysts. If they have communication to your CSF system, it can potentially help the neurosurgeons evaluate whether or not this um, ar arachnoid cyst will continuously come back because it's continuously getting a CSF um, reservoir. Help differentiate NPH from just benign brain atrophy, right? Older people, their brain shrinks. Um, it can enlarge the um, ventricles and we'll talk about something called ex vacuo hydrocephalus. Um, IIH, right? Patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension can follow them, progression, are their headaches getting worse? Maybe it's time to get an MRI uh, uh, CSF or CNA flow um, to evaluate um, their CSF dynamics. And then lastly, evaluation of carry malformations and the severity of their disturbance. And we'll sort of show you what that looks like here. So this is a, a sagittal view on an MRI. You can see that clearly this patient has a tonsillar descent, which defined by, or is a Chiari malformation. And here um, you can see the dynamics of uh, CSF as it moves through and there's, um, but no flow posteriorly. So anteriorly there, there's getting uh, flow, but on, on this study, you can kind of see the abnormality that's occurred and that tonsillar descent has really impaired this person's normal uh, CSF flow. So again, helpful in uh, these types of patients. Yeah, it's a great dynamic study, not available everywhere, but a lot of uh, specialty centers have it. So um, I think something that's probably underutilized. Definitely. So um, now getting to uh, the acute issues with hydrocephalus, this is when you sound the alarm. This is kind of the, the basis of our talk here. We get a lot of calls um, from emergency rooms um, or outpatient even um, about hydrocephalus. And um, I think it's difficult for providers to tease out what's acute, what can wait until next week, what can wait until next year. Um, yeah. And so we wanted to review uh, specifically signs of elevated intracranial pressure that are acute uh, for which a patient will need urgent intervention. So these are never missed. Yeah. Um, so in an emergency room or, you know, a patient is having signs and symptoms and they're going um, and getting advanced imaging, you get a CT of the head and it confirms what you thought the patient has some large ventricles. So when should I, you know, wake someone up at two o'clock in the morning or when, when, when is this not, um, you know, an acute finding? I think that's all helpful. So yeah. acute, severe, intractable headache. Uh, intractable nausea vomiting. This isn't, I, I had a headache and I threw up once and they're in there, you know, drinking apple juice. This yeah. is, um, they're lethargic. You cannot arouse them. They're, uh, they're vomiting, uh, nonstop. Um, and then you might see some pupillary changes or papilledema that goes along with that. Um, obviously, uh, it's difficult for many providers to have the equipment to be checking for papilledema in an acute setting. Um, and then late signs um, uh, of hydrocephalus is Cushing's triad, hypertension, bradycardia, and irregular breathing. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, you know, call immediately. So we, you know, ultimately our goal is to catch the folks that are here, right? The lethargy with CT evidence of hydrocephalus. We don't want, exactly. you know, the opportunity, you know, if obviously we're going to catch these patients, but we want to intervene way earlier in their course. Um, so the, the, the earlier we can get to patients where there's a suspicion of a clinical finding and neuroimaging that's also suggestive, tumor, blood, whatever it may be, um, you're probably already calling neurosurgery, but sometimes if there's a question, we'll always, you know, be able to give you some uh, advice and uh, intervene earlier. Yeah, just to keep in mind, you know, if you have a patient who walks into the emergency department and you notice they had ventricular megaly on their CAT scan, and then as they're sitting in the ER two or three hours later, now they're a little sleepy, but you go in and they're waking up and then an hour later, they're not waking up as briskly and, and now they're starting to vomit. You, you can see the progression of escalating hydrocephalus and something that you should be aware of. Definitely. One thing that we do, you know, use is a comparative study. So if, you, if we have a way to evaluate patient CT six months ago, one month ago, one week ago, all of that data is helpful. You know, hey, I looked at the CT, it looks big, you know, the ventricles are enlarged from before. Absolutely. That's easy, right? When it's stable, then we start to kind of get into um, their clinical, you know, symptom signs. Mm -hmm. So normal pressure hydrocephalus, I know uh, earlier in the year, uh, Dr. Glebus gave a wonderful talk about NPH, so we're not gonna go that deep into it. 
Um, but it's important to recognize this when we do talk about hydrocephalus, we can't not talk about MPH. Yeah, <clears throat> um, slow increase in ventricular size, the classic Hakeem triad, the wet, wacky, wobbly, right? Those are your urinary incontinence, um, gait instability, which we'll show you a video of um, cognitive and memory dysfunction. That's sort of where that dementia comes in. Um, and uh, sort of the imaging, again, suggestive of um, enlarged ventricles. So there's somebody in normal MRI um, and then somebody with uh, suspicion of NPH. Yeah, and this is certainly clinically significant, yeah. uh, but not an emergent finding. Um, so we'll use both of those clinical plus um, imaging findings to sort of lead us in the right direction. Um, again, our clinical exam, gradual onset of symptoms, the, the triad, in addition to other many other um, signs and symptoms, we're going to move towards that high volume LP where we get 30 to 40 cc's of fluid. Um, we're going to be testing the patient uh, with physical therapy colleagues um, before the LP, after the LP, um, 24 hours after, and then are they, you know, um, improving, right? Do they feel less foggy? Do they, do they um, get up and walk and their gait symptoms are improved? Or is it less, is it, you know, less, um, you know, you know, is there less information that um, the patient's gotten better, right? It's sort of equivocal. They really haven't improved. Those patients are not really shunt responsive. So we really want, um, obviously, the home runs, um, but sometimes we can, sure. we can also make some decisions about um, those patients that have some improvement, but not you know, uh, as, as market as the others. Yeah. And in interventions in uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus can be life-changing. Um, some of these patients get a shunt and they're, you know, completely different people and it affects their mobility and their memory. Um, but also there are risks to shunts and, uh, you know, shunt malfunctions and infections. And so it's not a benign procedure. And so we want to make sure that we're doing the best workup that we can. Um, you know, we work with a bunch of surgeons. We love to do surgery, but if it's not going to help someone, um, it's important that we tease that out before uh, putting someone through an invasive surgery. Definitely. Now, the Tinetti scoring, um, this is just a brief overview. We'll, you know, this will be available to you to review, but our physical therapy colleagues um, are essential in our uh, diagnosis and, uh, you know, constructing a plan for our normal pressure hydrocephalus patients. Um, they put the patient through a battery of physical therapy testing uh, before their lumbar puncture, and there's a scoring system, three different scores, a tug test, dynamic gait index, and a Berg score. Um, the patient undergoes a high volume lumbar puncture, um, taking off 30 to 40 cc's of CSF if, if you can. Um, and then one hour later, they uh, undergo the Tinetti scoring again. And a lot of times you'll see marked improvement. And if you do, that's a clinical indicator that the patient may benefit from a, from a VP shunt. Uh, we all, often also test uh, 24 hours later as well. Um, and then that, those scores help us determine how we will proceed uh, clinically. So here's a good example of somebody with a sort of classic magnetic gait. Um, they feel like their feet are stuck on the floor. He actually gets up pretty quickly um, and you can see him walk and he progresses well, but then you notice there's some significant fatigability um, as he's walking and um, it, it sort of renders, it makes the you know, diagnosis oftentimes we can't walk our patients, but looking at someone's gait is so important if you can. Um, especially if you're in an outpatient setting, have them walk up and down the hallway, and then you can sort of lend uh, lend a hand in understanding their diagnosis, some of their clinical findings, um, and um, you know hopefully offer some treatment. So you can see he's having some trouble here. Um, these are really good sort of shunt responsive patients if they um, improve significantly from here. Um, so you can kind of see they focus on how he's actually walking. Um, it's almost like magnets were stuck to his feet and he's just trying to pull them off. That's a classic sort of NPH. Uh, hydrocephalus ex vacuo. Um, I think this is another really common reason that we're consulted in patients and um, important to know just what this is. Uh, this is a compensatory enlargement of a CSF space. Um, an increase in the volume and enlargement of the ventricles, but it's caused by atrophy of the brain and loss of tissue. This can be as a result of a stroke. Um, just we can see this with aging. If someone has uh, more atrophy, 
uh, than is maybe expected for their age. This mm -hmm. is the, the read you'll see on the CAT scan is, you know, increased atrophy uh, greater than expected for age, correlate clinically, um, those sorts of things. So right. when you have a loss of volume of the brain, you may see an increase in CSF and that's not necessarily um, something that needs to be intervened on. Definitely. I think uh, it's important to just recognize that they may have this diagnosis, but um, again, lo loss of uh, significant atrophy, everything else just looks bigger. Um, so uh, sort of looking at their clinical history, putting it all together, um, you know, uh, that recognizing that this is a benign process. So when we talk about treatment and definitive treatment, we really talk about diversion of CSF, right? We're, we're moving CSF from one place to, the, to another place. In, in the cases of hydrocephalus, and particularly in acute setting, um, we're going to be doing um, extraventricular drain, which we'll sort of talk about. Um, see a shunting is sort of a more permanent procedure, uh, implanting a shunt, which we'll also talk about. And then ETV, which some of you may have not heard of, um, we do a lot in, in pediatrics, um, but an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which we'll talk about. Um, so first for EVD placement, um, so this is going to be the acute hydrocephalus patient. That's that the alarm has been sounded, the yes. patient's <laughs> lethargic, um, and they have an obstructive lesion and the hydrocephalus is acute. Um, some common indications of when we're putting in EVDs, um, obviously subarachnoid hemorrhage with the ob obstruction of the arachnoid villi, right? So they're not getting CSF out. Usually those subarachnoid hemorrhage patients that have a Hunt and Hess grade uh, three, they're more lethargic. They have folk uh, lateralizing signs. They're pretty sick patients. We're gonna put an EVD in. Cerebral edema from a traumatic brain injury, you know, it may have widespread um, global traumatic cerebral edema, surgical mass lesions, um, those big, big tumors that are pressing on one side of the brain, shifting things over, obstructing flow. Um, meningitis, um, rarely do we, we uh, put in EBDs, but um, sometimes it can be indicated. <clears throat> Chiari malformations that are significant with hydrocephalus. If the patient has a shunt failure, right? If they come in, they have a shunt, they're shunt dependent, meaning they're putting out a boatload of CSF um, and they are completely dependent on that shunt, right? If, they, if their shunt stops working, think of this as being just as acute as somebody who has a hemorrhage in their brain, right? Um, that they're not circulating CSF normally and they're continuously producing it, they're gonna need something, right? You may see us externalize a shunt, um, or potentially just put it in EVD. And then sometimes we, uh, our surgeons use it in the OR for brain relaxation. If we're, um, it, you know, aneurysm surgeries, sometimes they'll do um, uh, an EVD or if they're, you know, working in an area where um, there is hydrocephalus, maybe there's a pineal tumor or a colloid cyst. Um, so diversion of CSF in the acute setting, um, we're looking at an extra ventricular drain. Uh, you may have seen these, we'll place them in the emergency department and the ICU. Um, this is the mainstay of first line treatment for acute hydrocephalus. Uh, this is a drain that is placed, we place them at the bedside. Um, you drill a hole um, and place this drain through and uh, enter into the ventricle so you can um, offer di diversion of that CSF release the pressure, you can monitor the pressure. Um, if the pressure becomes too high, you can drain off of this. Um, and this is really a temporizing measure um, for patients who come in with acute hydrocephalus. So we'll show you what this looks like. Um, <clears throat> without getting too graphic, this is, um, here's a patient, they're marking out their particular landmarks um, that the, uh, patient is identifying. Um, so here, again, this is a, even though it's a blind procedure, we use normal anatomic landmarks uh, to place a drain um, using some lidocaine for our tunneling tract as well. They're doing this in the operating room. So um, they have towels. We, so we do them at the bedside a lot of times. So um, we may use our own drapes, making it a skin incision. Um, <clears throat> and I'm moving through here just to show you some key parts. Um, we put in a retractor and then we drill by hand. Um, it seems kind of barbaric, but um, it's an effective way to enter the skull. We use a, something called a, a craniostomy drill. Um, an incision is made um, into the dura. And then um, you can either, they, they're tunneling this catheter ahead of time. And then here's actually the ventriculostomy going in this red catheter, which is antibiotic impregnated. 
using uh, specific landmarks um, to then place the catheter. You'll see them go to a very specific depth. We don't go deeper than that um, particular depth um, for um, avoiding any critical brain structures. Um, but here you can see he passed the catheter and then um, you have a egress of CSF. <clears throat> so we'll go back to our PowerPoint. So uh, extra ventricular drain is a great uh, short-term solution uh, to hydrocephalus, uh, but patients who um, have a uh, permanent injury um, or are born with some sort of congenital problem, uh, we have to look at a long-term solution for diverting CSF. Um, and usually after someone's in the hospital seven, 10 days and their uh, system hasn't recovered, we start considering a shunt. Um, and so it's similar. Uh, the proximal portion of the catheter is the same. It goes into the ventricular system. Um, and then up on the top of the head, there's an incision made and there's a valve placed and then the tubing is tunneled to a distal location. And um, how do we determine where that goes? Uh, I would say ventricular peritoneal um, into the abdomen is the most common place that you'll see um, the distal uh, end of the catheter placed, but there are some other options. Um, certainly patients who have recurrent infections or an intra-abdominal process maybe aren't able to have a peritoneal catheter. And so uh, other distal locations could include uh, an atrial um, uh, location, ventricular pleural, lumboperitoneal, um, and less commonly some of the other intra-abdominal organs. Um, but this shunts the CSF away from the head goes into the distal location, uh, wherever that may be, and then the body's able to absorb that CSF um, from that other location. You know, sometimes people are like, oh, well, you're going to do a VA shunt. And we, for us, it's sort of benign, but you're like, we're putting it into the heart. And they're like, yeah. oh my gosh, into the heart. Well, you know, that's a great place to continuously reabsorb um, CSF back into circulation because that's the main goal. So we need to find an anatomic sort of reservoir um, so that we can get the CSF back because you, it needs to be continuously circulated just like it is in the brain. Go ahead. Uh, the, the third way that we can divert CSF is through an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Um, I think this is kind of the, the less known way of, of treating uh, hydrocephalus, especially in adults. Um, but this is a great alternative. It can uh, keep you from placing a lifelong permanent device uh, like a shunt um, in a patient. And so this is a neuroendoscopic procedure that provides a communication between the third ventricle and, and the rest of the CSF spaces. Um, it depends on uh, the patient, the reason that they have hydrocephalus, uh, you know, have they had uh, infections in the past or prior shunt failure, all of those things are uh, important factors that we consider. Um, but we have a um, a uh, video here on the next slide that just gives you a general overview. Um, I think this can be a great uh, option for some patients. So. Endoscopic third and treating obstructive so hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus and stenosis. Just into planning was Same performed. way we Same enter. Small neuropen endoscope is within the pillowy sheath. The sheath has to be exactly perpendicular to the scalp or the skull. Here it's angulated, so we use no navigation and uh, the perpendicular angle, as you can see here, to cannulate the ventricle. The pillowy sheath should not be inserted deeper to injure the fornix or other structures within the ventricle. Next, the uh, stylet of the pillowy sheath is removed, the endoscope is introduced, the and the ventricle is entered, as you can see here. Then the sheath is peeled away and stapled to the scalp. And now we'll start our interventricular work. Here's the ipsilateral ventricle. Entering the third ventricle, you can see the floor just entered to the mammillary bodies here, the endoscopic grasper is used to create the hole in multiple different directions, usually 90 degrees apart. It's opened and then withdrawn to avoid any vascular injury. Endoscope is then introduced within the interpeduncular cisterns. So a short or All right, we'll pause there. Good patency of the... Uh, All right. So you're basically going in 
um, and opening up this closed space uh, in hopes that CSF will be able to freely flow in between uh, the spaces and then you can avoid the need for a shunt in the future. Um, now, moving on to shunting, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about this. This is um, just uh, something that we receive a lot of phone calls about. I think there's a lot of anxiety surrounding patients that have shunts. Um, and it, it's um, an implanted device and things can go wrong. And so it's important we can recognize when, when maybe something isn't functioning appropriately. So a patient comes into the emergency department and they have a headache and they have a shunt. What are we gonna do? Uh, this happens so frequently. Um, so anytime there is a shunt in place and a concern or question of potential hydrocephalus, we need a CAT scan of the head. Um, if there are prior images to compare to, that is extremely helpful. Very helpful. Because um, a lot of these patients, especially with congenital problems, um, their anatomy doesn't look the same as everyone else's. And, and what's normal for them may not be normal for uh, someone else. And so comparison phones are hugely uh, helpful. But also, uh, we want to take a look at the entire shunt. So this is tubing that comes from the ventricle, goes down, uh, is tunneled behind your ear, down across your chest wall, and, in, and usually into the abdomen. And so we need pictures of the entire uh, uh, length of the tubing to make sure, you know, if it, this was placed as a child and you grow, sometimes these can pop apart um, and mm -hmm. have discontinuity. So a shunt series is just a series of x-rays, uh, a lateral skull x-ray. This can also um, help us determine the type of shunt. So maybe yep. you, you don't know, this patient just comes into the ER, you've never seen them before. Um, yeah, you can see on the lateral skull x-ray what the shunt looks like. And, and you know, there's numerous brands of shunts, but they all look different. And mm -hmm. so just by that lateral skull x-ray, we can tell what it is and what it's set at, if it's able to be set. Um, so that's huge, very important information. Um, we get a lateral neck x-ray, a chest x-ray, and a KUV. This allows us to track the tubing down through the entire body, make sure there's no discontinuity. Um, another way to evaluate uh, the shunt is there's a reservoir that sits um, on top of the skull. And this area. Yeah, the top area there. And, and you can push on that and, and palpate it and it should briskly refill. If it's not refilling, maybe there's an issue proximally where the CSF is blocked and, and is uh, not filling the reservoir. So those are just the basic things. If someone calls me and says, I think someone shunt is malfunctioning, we'll, we'll look at a CAT scan, a shunt series, and then we'll come and look at the reservoir itself um, and see if we can't determine from those non-invasive measures what's going on with the shunt. Definitely. Um, just to <clears throat> just to reiterate, you know, these we we can identify probably ninety plus percent of all types of shunts just by X-ray alone. There are a lot older models that are potentially just fixed pressure um, that we sometimes have to get creative to try and figure out um, if they've had the shunt for a long time. Uh, but in most cases, an X-ray will tell us. So don't don't you know freak out. You don't have to make model. Just really, when was it put in? What was the reason? Um, and uh, those imaging uh, studies prior is, is super helpful. Yeah, and just correlate clinically. Uh, a lot of these patients have had shunts for their entire lives. And so someone comes in and says, uh, you know, every time my shunt malfunctions, I get these four symptoms. Definitely. And this is what I've had for the past three days. Listen to those people. They know what they're talking about. They know their bodies. They they know if they've had a shunt their whole life, what it feels like when it's not working and, and whether or not the imaging correlates with what they're saying. Those people come back and those people get shunt revisions because they they yep. know what it feels like. And so um, definitely a history and a clinical correlation is hugely important in these patients. Um, shunt infections, um, unfortunately, as we talked about before, this isn't a benign procedure. Um, it's a foreign body and infection rates are significant. Um, and also failure rates. A two-year failure rate can be up upwards of 40%. So um, you know, it's, it's a frustrating thing and, um, something we need to pay attention to. So infections, uh, risk of infection is for many different reasons. What is the cause of their hydrocephalus? How long has the shunt been there? Um, how long was the operation when they had the shunt placed? Um, is there a second system that's non-functional? So if you have a shunt placed as a child, let's say on the right side of your brain, and then in, maybe in your teens, you need another shunt. Sometimes they just move over to the other side of the brain and put a second shunt in. So mm -hmm. you have a functioning shunt and a non-functional shunt. Well, is that non-functional uh, shunt, is it still there? Is it seeded with infection? Those things um, can cause recurrent infections. Um, or is there a CSF leak postoperatively? Any 
uh, you know, if CSF is getting out, CS, uh, bacteria can get in. And so that can cause higher uh, rates of infection as well. So uh, we get called all the time, patient has a shunt and, you know, they have an elevated white blood cell count or they have a fever. Well, we need to rule out systemic infection first. Um, just Definitely. the basics, blood cultures, urine cultures, sputum cultures, get a chest x-ray, um, look for the, you know, we're looking for the horses, not the zebras. And so we want to look for the more common um, infections first, but that doesn't mean the shunt's not infected, but we want to make sure that we're not overlooking um, a less serious infection. Look at the shunt, look at the track of the shunt. Is there, as in this picture, is there breakdown over the shunt? Yep. Um, obvious things that would tell you that it's infected. Um, you can also consider um, CT of the head, CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, if you want to get um, a good picture of the catheter as it goes all the way down and where it is in the abdomen. Um, one thing we wanted uh, to remind everyone, shunts are MRI compatible. It is important to know the type of shunt because the magnet from MRI may move the setting of the shunt. And so some shunts you need to get an x-ray or, or even just check the shunt before they have an MRI so that you know um, after the MRI if at. it's moved because yeah. you don't want it you know, to be draining at one level and then you double that and then they have a problem because the shunt setting has moved. So just something to keep in mind, but um, they are MRI compatible. <clears throat> so some diagnosis and treatment, uh, evaluating the CSF, if we're gonna go ahead and um, you know try and sample, usually we try and go for lumbar puncture first. If it's a continuous system, we can sample the CSF that way. Um, if the patient truly has an infection, we don't want to potentially introduce that infection by tapping the shunt. Yeah. We do tap shunts, we use a little butterfly needle and then tap the reservoir. It's a self-sealing type of plastic um, that will allow us to uh, gain access to CSF. We're going to send it for basically the full set um, glucose protein cell count. Um, if your institution has a CSF lactate, those are helpful. Um, culture gram stain are critical uh, to obtain and then um, gone away with are the 15 different panels, the meningoencephalitis panel sort of eliminates that and we can test for herpetic issues, West Nile, all of those. Um, appropriate antibiosis for penetration into the, into the CSF, vancomycin, weight-based dose, if you're going to use that, vanco, um, if they don't have an allergy, cefepime and flagyl are going to be um, sure mainstays. Yeah, absolutely. If you think someone's infected, if you think they have a shunt infection, we need to be giving them antibiotics that are going to cross over and cover the CSF. We should, you know, be on a PO tablet of something. If you really think they're infected, make sure you're choosing the appropriate antibiotics. Uh, and then last, we just wanted to touch briefly on shunt programming, um, just uh, as an overall um, educational point that these shunts can be programmed. Um, uh, they're all programmed externally, depends on the brand, but these are some pictures of different shunt programmers. So if a patient, we put in a shunt and we get a CAT scan in a month and their ventricles are still large, well, then we can just adjust, adjust the shunt at the bedside or in our office and, and choose how much CSF we want um, to be coming out. And so it's not a perfect science. Sometimes adjustments need to be made. Find so, a happy place. Yeah, it's very yeah. easy. It's yeah. not in the office. It's painless. Um, so just, I think, some information that's good to know. All right. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. That was a great, great talk. I'm actually getting the messages, you know, that it's such, such a clear, you know, such a difficult topic in such a clear way. Thank you very much. We have a couple, we have some questions for you guys. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to read them. Up. Um, one question is, I had a patient with congenital hydrocephalus and it was treated at the age of six, but it was done in 1950s. And it was treated with choroid plexatum instead of ventricle peritoneal shunt. I know we're mostly focused on adults, but is that surgery done anymore or, or shunting st standard is now? I think for uh, patients with congenital hydrocephalus, we're trying to use a lot of tools to sort of tailor to the patient. I don't think we've done one of those at least in my 10 years as a PA and, and you know, um, in our experience, but um, we have had patients that have had congenital hydrocephalus that we offer ETV to as an adult um, to see if that can avoid shunting. But in most cases, these patients already have shunts and um, we uh, move towards shunting if patients have recurrent hydrocephalus. Sure, um, and another question. Um it starts with a very interesting lecture. Thank you. Um, arachnoid granulations, uh, can you describe them just a little bit more? Yeah. So uh, the arachnoid I granulations- expert or anything, you know, what you're gonna do, what you're gonna Oh, do. sure. Um, the arachnoid granulations are sort of projections that um, are basically gonna move CSF 
from the, the uh, subarachnoid space into the uh, venous system. So it's almost like the pathway that um, our body uses to um, move CSF from sort of the uh, intracranial space into your dural sinuses. And so um, those are common places where they can be obstructed. Like one of the most common things we see is sort of when patients have subarachnoid hemorrhage from an aneurysm, mm -hmm. um, blood fills the subarachnoid space. It doesn't go intraparenchymal, it's sort of around the brain. And then as it, as it sort of pools or patients have thick subarachnoid hemorrhage, those arachnoid granulations can't push CSF into the, the dural sinuses and then they get hydrocephalus. Their ventricles may not look massive, um, but we recognize that with enough subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, those granulations are going to be obstructed. These patients are going to become lethargic. They're under pressure, you know, and they and they have hydrocephalus. So yeah, so simply it's just the channel that that's bringing the CSF from one place to another. And if that channel becomes blocked, then you can see acute hydrocephalus. Next question: In case of intraventricular uh, hemorrhage, is there a predictable timeline for decompensation if the patient is not treated, or is it some uh, individual case specific? That's a good question. Good um, question. <clears throat> we, we probably have seen a bunch of different cases where they have mild IVH, let's say in, in somebody who has a headache and they just have a little bit of blood that layers one of their lateral ventricles, but the patient's awake, talking, and they're fine. Um, and then there are other cases where we have somebody who has something called casted ventricles, where they just have blood that's sitting there as an organized clot and blood, you know, CSF can't move across that. So I think there's a lot of different degrees. Would you? I think there's a lot of factors. Uh, where yeah. is the hemorrhage? How big is the hemorrhage? If we see a uh, casted fourth uh, ventricle, that person we, we know is probably developing hydrocephalus in the next, yeah. you know, what is it, six or 12 hours. Unfortunately, I wish we had a better um, way to tell who would get hydrocephalus and who wouldn't. Um, but we use, uh, you know, uh, radiographic findings and physical exam findings to, yeah. to predict how a patient uh, a clinical course might be. Um, and some patients we can say, yes, they will, and no, they won't. And then of course there's all those people in between that's sort of a gray area. But I would say patients where we aren't sure, we never want to do an invasive procedure um, and place a drain if they don't need it. We watch them clinically. They're in an yeah. ICU. They're getting checked every hour. If they they start to show signs or symptoms of hydrocephalus. We'll do serial imaging. Um, in general, I'd say broadly, maybe uh, 72 hours after uh, an intraventricular hemorrhage or something, we start to become less concerned that they're going to yeah. develop hydrocephalus. But there are the patients who go on to have a late hydrocephalus, and in five or six days later, they're out on the floor and become acutely abducted, and, and they have. Unfortunately, we can't predict 100%. Um, but we use we we use all the information that we have in front of us to make the best decision we can. Yeah, and I just think of relying on neuroimaging. You know, serial imaging is what we go by to say that this patient isn't progressing with, like Danielle said, clinic, good clinical exam. Um, so we'll oftentimes get CAT scan if we have a high suspicion, maybe in six hours, twelve hours, um, and ensuring that there's stability across those. Then we feel a little bit better that um, this patient may not need a drain, but um, we have a high suspicion and we keep an eye out for it very closely. So I'm looking through questions and uh, a majority of them you already answered your, uh, your talk about your, your complications, MRI compatibility, the, how to check whether the shunt is intact, et cetera. So uh, okay. I, one more question and then and, and we'll be done. Do young people decompensate faster with hydrocephalus than the old people? Um, I think in general, um, the younger population so as we age, our brains atrophy. And so when your brain is atrophied, you have more space inside your skull. But it, in the end of the day, your skull is in an enclosed space. And so I think maybe they would, they could decom decompensate a little bit faster because they don't have, you know, that extra com compliance in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, acute hydrocephalus can develop uh, pretty quickly. So definitely, I think um, the mechanism is really important to, re you know, recognize like um, <clears throat> patients, let's say high velocity head trauma, um, and then they have traumatic cerebral edema, and then they develop hydrocephalus. Well, like that young 18 year old, um, let's say, you know, on a motorcycle, um, doesn't, is not going to have the same reserve because he has just very full, normal brain. And so his ability to sort of compensate uh, from that also with other, you know, uh, traumatic findings really um, impair his ability to, to have normal CSF dynamics. And so um, really, I think the etiology and the sort of what happened to the patient, why they get hydrocephalus really sort of um, 
poor tens or can understand when they can decompensate faster. You know, our, our sort of light bulb and suspicion is going to go off a little faster if their mechanism is very, very significant. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if the mechanism, like Randy said, is maybe traumatic and you're, you have contusions and they're evolving over the next 72 hours, um, as that happens, the edema increases. Well, you might see delayed hydrocephalus, but it's because of the underlying pathology that's been developing right. for the past few days, not necessarily because of the age of the patient. Well, Danielle, Randall, thank you very much for this great talk. And with this talk, we actually conclude our grand rounds for this academic year. Um, I would like to wish everybody a very nice summer. And then we're hoping to see you again uh, in, back in September. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.